<laughs> Thank you, brother. I love it. I love that 12 string. I love hearing it. It's great for us to be able to worship together. As we're in this Advent season, as we're getting closer and closer uh, to Christ uh, approaching and drawing near as a little child, uh, we've been encountering God in the crashes that have been all around us. Many of you encountered our Holy Family last week uh, downstairs at the Star Plaza Inn. We looked at Mary a couple of weeks ago. Some crazy guy in a Joseph outfit showed up yes last week. That was crazy. So we're on now to the shepherds. And let's listen to uh, our text. It comes out of Luke 2, some of those uh, verses we've just heard. Let's listen to them again. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But an angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. For today, in the, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you, and he is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby, wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. And when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. This is the word of the Lord for us today. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let us pray. Lord, as we come to the manger, as we come during Advent, Help us to encounter you, to experience you in new ways. May your spirit rest upon us. May you speak your word to us and let us hear what it is that you have to say to each one of us. Meet us in this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, over the last number of months, I've been on a bit of a Revolutionary War kick. It really started in July. You see, last Christmas, my aunt had uh, gifted Jane and I uh, with two tickets to go see Hamilton. But of course, the tickets were for July, that was last Christmas. We finally got to enjoy our, our present. And we went to go and see this show. Now, I had intentionally, I'd heard a lot of things about it, but I intentionally not uh, listened to anything, not researched it. I wanted to go and kind of experience it fresh. And, well, it was fresh. Uh, it's a, a very, I don't know, how many of you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, how many? Okay. A few of you do. Those of you who do will, will, will attest to the fact that it is very different. Those of you who have not had a chance to experience it yet, I encourage you to. Uh, just know that it's going to be very different. So in our cars, we have the, uh, the CDs that are the clean version. That should warn you right there. The clean version. And uh, my son and I especially have been really enjoying uh, the, the first CD of that over the last uh, few months. So we've been diving into our revolutionary history. And one of the most important battles of the Revolutionary period is the Battle of Yorktown. You may remember, this is near the end of the war when uh, General Washington gets news 
that uh, Cornwallis and the British are, are on their way to the coast and they're setting up a base, a camp, at a place called Yorktown. Now the British don't know that, that the French are sending a fleet and that fleet was dispatched to go to Yorktown and set up a naval blockade, trapping the British uh, from the uh, sea, the ocean side, while Washington marched his troops double quick across land to set up a perimeter around them, trapping the British forces in their base. Now, three weeks go by in this siege of Yorktown before the British finally capitulate as a young man waves a white flag on a, on a parapet and Cornwallis surrenders his sword. Biographer Ron Chernow describes the scene vividly that comes next. He writes, tens of thousands of onlookers gaped in amazement as the shattered British troops marched out of Yorktown and to the tune of an old English ballad, the world turned upside down. They moved between parallel rows of handsomely outfitted French soldiers and battered and ragged American troops. The unimaginable had occurred. A scruffy, unruly, ill-equipped conglomeration of farmers had soundly beaten the world's greatest, most well-trained, best-equipped, best-led military force, the British Army. And the words of those British soldiers as they marched out in humiliation well expressed the bemused shock of civilized Europe. For at Yorktown, the world truly did turn upside down. In many ways, the incarnation that we celebrate at Christmas is akin to this dramatic turn of events at the Battle of Yorktown. For Christmas is, as the ancestors knew it, but in, at Christmas, the world as the ancestors knew it was turned upside down. The incarnation, that, that invading power of this little baby born in squalor in an out-of-the-way village changed everything that was to come. Luke knew this, and he illustrates this in the way that he sets up the second chapter of his gospel, describing at the beginning the world stage Caesar Augustus in Rome, Quirinius in Syria, the notables, the movers, and the shakers, the dignitaries, the important folk. But then as his story continues, we come to a stark contrast with this grand and impressive beginning. The story describes a humble setting where the Savior of the world is born. He comes without fanfare, without pomp, without circumstance, without royal decrees, without proclamations or celebrations. Luke's description is very simple. While when they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, and wrapped him in cloths, and placed him in a manger. And that's it. That's it. Through that humble, mundane birth, the world turned upside down. And who was it that attended Mary and Joseph on that auspicious night? Well, it wasn't the ones that we would have expected. I remember when, uh, when my children were born, we thought very carefully about who we were going to have there at the hospital, okay? Grandma and Grandpa, Grandma and Grandpa, both sides were there. They were playing bridge while Jay was doing But when our son came into the world, all of them were there. We were very picky about who we wanted to be there for that moment. 
Maybe that was the case for some of you, or maybe you know people who think who plan these types of things out. Well, those that were there for the beginning of our Savior's time on this earth were not the well-to-do, not the important folks. They were shepherds. Shepherds. Filthy, loud, obnoxious, unkept, low-class, scrubby, ill-tongued, ill-mannered, there do well, bottom of the barrel, dregs of society, shepherds. Ugh! Shepherds. You know, those were some of the more polite words used to describe this group of people in the first century. In the social hierarchy of the first century, shepherds well, they were down near the bottom, if not at the bottom of the list. They were considered unclean by virtue of their profession. They lived their lives out of doors, wandering in a nomadic existence, following the flocks. They didn't even own the sheep that they took care of. No, the owners of the sheep were those who lived up in Jerusalem in the nice houses, uh, enjoying the benefits of the wool and the meat that the flocks provided. A number of those flocks belonged to the wealthy uh, religious folks there in Jerusalem. And those sheep that those shepherds watched were probably the very same that were brought to the temple and offered as sacrifices every Passover, bringing to mind the Lamb of God who would then come to be that sacrifice just a few years later outside of Jerusalem. But that's another story for another day. We're focusing today on the shepherds. The shepherds, those, those poor of the first century Palestine doing a job that nobody else wanted to do. But it's to them that the angels came that night to announce the good news of this birth. News that should have come first to the ears of the kings and the priests shared instead with the dregs of society. Good news! Tonight, a Savior is born. Now, when the shepherds first saw those angels, their, their first instinct would have been to hide, for angels are not a good sign in the Old Testament. Usually, if an angel shows up, somebody's going to die. So the shepherds would have been looking for a way out. But these angels had a special message that they had been ordained to give to these least likely recipients. Messiah has come, and you are going to go visit him. You'd almost hear the shepherd saying, um, excuse me, hi, yeah, we're down here. Uh, sounds great, really excited about this baby. Think you yeah, took a wrong turn somewhere a little bit south of Jerusalem uh, because the Messiah's parents are not going to want to see us, especially when we've been out with the sheep all night. Why would the Messiah's parents want to see us? See, they didn't know that Christ had come to turn the world upside down. Turn the world upside down, and he was going to start that work with them. No dignitaries from Jerusalem were welcomed at the manger. The good news was going to be spread at a grassroots level, starting with those who least deserved this honor, the shepherds. And as the news filtered out about the news of this miraculous birth, as word got around through the, the communities, it would have been the ears that many years later on would have remembered hearing about this from those shepherds. Not some high-handed decree or proclamation, not some legislation from the religious rulers. It would have been gossip through the grapevine of the shepherds about something special that was happening. It started these, the appeal that Jesus would have had throughout his ministry. 
It's okay, shepherds, the angel said. For tonight, you're not going to be excluded. You're not going to be left out in the cold. This baby that's been born is just like your babies. Just like you. And, and the sign that you're going to look for to know that what I'm telling you is true is this. You're going to find that baby wrapped up in common clothes and placed in a manger just like any other simple peasant baby in a simple peasant home. A common baby born for a common the world turned upside down. Well, that finally got the shepherds going. They couldn't wait to see the peasant king who would be Messiah. And they found the scene just as the angels described it. No lordly accoutrements, no fanfare, just the sign that the angels told them. A baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger, just like it had been done at their births and at their children's birth and their children's children's birth. So the shepherds found Jesus coming into the world in the usual and common way. Just as he would relate to those common people throughout his ministry in the usual way. He could relate to them at birth. And the shepherds found a welcome at the manger. The unclean by social standards were judged clean. The outcasts became the honored guest. The songs of angels was heard by the simplest of all, and the world was turned upside down. You know, that birth ushered in a new reality that we, as we gather here 2,000 years later, inherit as the people of God. For centuries, we have celebrated this birth we rejoiced at how Christ came to make all things new, to, to shake up the establishments and the powers of this world so that the first would be last and the last would be first. So that those who are humble, those who mourn, those who are peacemakers, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be blessed, as the scripture says. And yet our world resists being turned upside down. Each generation runs up against the same challenges where those who might find respite, seeking a welcome at the manger, are excluded because they're not smart enough or good enough or rich enough or whatever it might be to merit inclusion. God's incarnational work that began at the manger is that which continues in each one of us today to announce to the world that things don't have to remain the way they are. We don't have to live in a world where strong dominates weak, where poverty and exclusion and fear are the norms. Our world, too, can be turned upside down. Recently, my son joined a club at his school. It's called the Make a Difference Club. And he's got a plan for making the world different in his own unique way. You see, Liam derives great comfort and peace from stuffed animal dogs. He has a whole collection of them, and he sleeps with them. But then he shares them, and he makes sure that each one of us gets a dog to go to sleep with at night. And woe it is to us if he comes in the middle of the night and he comes and checks, do you have the dog? Do you have the dog? Do you have the dog? Well, his purpose in sharing them is so that we can be comforted the way that he is. And so his mission through the Make a Difference Club is to ensure that all children in our area get a stuffed animal dog that they can sleep with, too. <coughs> Dogs that will help them to fight away the nightmares, that will give them peace. His way of turning the world upside down. What's yours? What's your way? How will you work to turn this world of ours upside down? Perhaps it needs to start by turning our own worlds upside down. The Christ child comes to do that for us. 
He comes to shake up our expectations and our preconceived notions. He enters our hearts and makes room there by casting aside those things that would keep us from him. In this Christmas season, are there things inside of you that need to be turned upside down so that you can fully experience the joy and the wonder that those shepherds encountered so long ago? Are there old grudges or angers that eat away at your soul? Is there forgiveness that needs to be offered? Or perhaps a, a change in the way that you would spend your time to, to focus on that which is more eternally significant. Time's running out this Christmas season, but it's not too late. Not too late to spend some time, to find some quiet space this coming week and ask yourself, what things inside of you need to be turned upside down so that Christ can reign even more in your life? And as the incarnate Christ enters even more deeply into our hearts, he leads us into that kingdom work of turning this world upside down, work that we're a part of here at Southminster in so many ways, work that declares we're not going to stand by, we're not going to accept the intolerant, the angry, the manipulative, the oppressive values of society. Like our fathers before us, we dream of a better world, and we're going to work together to see that happen. So all who are weak, all who are wounded, a little scruffy, discouraged, bedraggled, beat up, burnt out, all who are shepherds, there's a place for you at the manger. Come and experience Christmas. An encounter again, the child in the manger who came to turn the world upside down. May you know that Christ child and experience him this season.